down in the lowly vale, living waters never fail. You're hearing Sister R. Mildred Barker leading the United Society of Shakers at Sabbath Day Lake, Maine, uh, singing their old traditional songs. The song is called Down in the Lowly Vale and re was recorded uh, for an album in 1976. Um, at that time, the Shakers of Sabbath Day, Maine uh, counted themselves six women and three men making up nine practicing Shaker total. Uh, last I knew, at, um, on my last visit to the Canterbury Shaker Village, I understand that there are only two remaining uh, practicing Shakers left and still at the Sabbath Day Maine congregation. The Shakers first arrived in the colonial United States in the 1780s. Uh, they were founded by uh, Mother Ann Lee in 1747, um, and their original name is the United Society of Believers in Christ's Second Appearing. Because they had uh, ecstatic worship services where they would shake and quake about, they became known as the Shaking Quakers. They practiced equality of the sexes, but they had total celibacy and separation of the sexes. Um, upon their arrival in Waterlay in New York in the 1770s, uh, they began to pr practice a communal utopia lifestyle where they shared all things in common um, and they also opposed war and uh, opposed slavery um, but established their own sectarian separatist communities. Um, they were pioneers of early American socialism. And when we find ourselves in the place to Christ will be in the valley of love and delight what you're hearing now is one of the most famous of the old Shaker hymns. Uh, it's a song entitled Simple Gifts or uh, Tis a Gift to be Simple. Um, there are a couple legends about how and why it was written. Um, Joseph Brackett of Alfred Maine was one of the uh, the Gorham Shakers members, and uh, he had written a lot of a lot of the Shaker songs. Uh, however, the Shakers attribute the song to a so-called Negro spirit um, that they heard at the Canterbury, New Hampshire Shaker Village. The song was a gift from the spirit worlds. Shakers for colonialism until after the Civil War. I hope you'll join me on Pioneers of American Socialism. The insidious myths of the mid-20th century Cold War period was the idea that socialism and communism had no historical basis in the United States. The Cold Warriors used the erasure of American history to smear the Communist Party of the United States as un-American. This orthodoxy is anti-communist propaganda based on a lie. Socialists and communists have been at the forefront of every progressive movement in the United States from colonial times to today. Early American socialism began before America with the native nations from whom the Europeans stole the land. It continued through religious refugees from Europe like Shakers. The early American socialist movement hit its peak with the Robert Owen and Charles Fourier inspired movements in the 1830s and 40s. Then in the 1850s, a wave of European immigrants fleeing persecution from the revolutions of 1848 against the Prussian Empire brought the first Marxists to the United States from France and Germany. These 48ers became the earliest abolitionist mobilizations in the American Civil War. The anti-communist consensus school historians of the 1950s rewrote the history of early America to write out the contributions of socialists and communists to early progress in, in anti-slavery, women's suffrage, religious freedom, native sovereignty, and social welfare. Welcome to Pioneers of American Socialism. The Shakers, a religious community in an American tradition. A better world is hard to come by, but that's not for want of trying. Over the ages, countless ways to improve society have been tried, and one of the most persistent has been living in community. In America, a native tradition of separate, single-minded communities followed their own way of life 
began when the pilgrims arrived. It blossomed in a golden age of idealistic utopian communities in the 19th century, when the nation was dotted with small independent communal villages living according to an amazing variety of new social and economic systems. Among these were religious groups like the Shakers, who tried to create heaven on earth. More than most of the reformers, the Shakers succeeded. During the 18th century, when they sailed to the New World from England, and the 19th, when Shakerism reached its zenith, thousands of men and women, and sometimes entire families, left their homes to live the Shaker way. Renouncing marriage and personal property, they lived simply and selflessly in 10 states, Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Maine, Florida, and Georgia. While these rural religious retreats were not everyone's idea of utopia, the Shakers were the most successful and the longest lasting communitarians in American history. They gave equal rights to women, welcomed all races, opposed war, strove for perfection in their work, and danced in worship of a mother and father God. They still live in New England. Although greatly reduced in number, members of the United Society of Believers in Christ's second appearing keep the faith that asks purity, simplicity, and community. And this is a better world for their trying. Flo Morse, The Story of the Shakers, 1989. United Society of Believers in Christ's Second Appearing, known colloquially as Shakers, arrived in North America in 1774. Their founder, Mother Anne Lee, began agitating for renunciation of sin and celibacy in the 1760s, which landed her in prison. In 1770, while in prison, she had visions telling her to lead a spiritual movement renouncing the lust and sin that it influenced. Shaker leaders posthumously announced that she was the female reincarnation of Jesus Christ. After the English Revolution, heretical doctrines like hers encouraged severe and violent persecution. After a series of incidents where Congregationalists attacked Shakers, who they called heretics, they fled to England. The Shakers successfully built the first self-consciously communal villages in the New World. Shaker communes established a foundation for socialism in America. The Shakers practiced community of property, complete celibacy, and separate but equal segregation of the genders. By the early 19th century, they chose New Lebanon and upstate New York for their headquarters. By the mid-19th century, other religious groups inspired by the Shakers' success, including the Icarians, the Zorites, the Amana Society Inspirationists, and the Rapite Harmonists, also fled Europe and started their own communes in the United States. In a piece entitled Description of Recently Founded Communist Colonies Still in Existence, first published in the German newspaper Deutsch Burger Fur in 1845, Karl Marx's comrade and writing partner Frederick Engels cheered these utopian experiments in America, writing, For communism, social existence, and activity based on community of goods, it is not only possible, but has actually been realized in many communities in America and in one place in England with great success, you shall see. Engels went on to describe what he knew of the Shaker community at New Lebanon, New York. Another colony of Shakers, New Lebanon in the state of New York, was visited by a second English traveler by the name of Pitt Keithley in the year 1842. Mr. Pitt Keithley most thoroughly inspected the whole town, which numbers some 800 inhabitants, and owns between seven and 8,000 acres of land. He examined its, its workshops and factories, its tanneries, sawmills, and so on, and declares the whole arrangement to be perfect. He too is surprised at the wealth of these people who began with nothing and are now becoming richer with each passing year. And he says, they are happy and gay among themselves. There's no quarreling, but on the contrary, friendliness and love prevail through their habitation, in every part of which reigns an orderliness and regularity which have not their equal. As we said, 
They enjoy complete community of goods and have 10 such communities in the United States of North America. There's still an open air shaker museum at Mount Lebanon at the Mount Lebanon site. My wife and I decided to take a trip up to New Lebanon on a pleasant late May day. It was about a four hour drive from our home in Rochester. We remarked at the beauty of the Hudson Valley as we glided along above it all. When we reached the shaker community at New Lebanon, it was quiet, although there were several cars parked in various places. We explored the buildings in the self-guided tour. There are brochures available on one of the buildings that guide the visitor through the historic community. Admission to the village is free all year, although the buildings are not open. It's now the grounds of the Darrow School, a private college prep boarding school. The Darrow School campus and dormitories have been closed due to COVID-19, another example of how, like the outbreak of typhus at the Sotus Bay Phalanx, pandemic and epidemic diseases can be extremely dangerous in congregate living settings. The idea of a private school is not entirely beyond the pale for Shaker theology. Shakers spurn the state. Engels wrote of their attitude toward the law. In their 10 towns, there is not a single gendarme or police officer, no judge, lawyer, or soldier, no prison or penitentiary. penitentiary. And yet there is proper order in all their affairs. The laws of the land are not for them, and as far as they're concerned, could just as well be abolished and nobody would notice any difference, for they are the most peaceable citizens and have never yielded a single criminal for the prisons. John 15, 19 says, If you are of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this the world hates you. The Shakers' experiences in Europe made this Bible verse really resonate with them. They did, distrusted state institutions, which led them to create their own alternative institutions. The Shakers set up their own school system in New Lebanon in 1815. They based their system on the cutting-edge Lancasterian system. British educator Joseph Lancaster recommended the classroom be a parallelogram, the length about twice the width, the windows were to be six feet from the floor, the floor should be inclined, rising one foot in twenty from the master's desk to the upper end of the room where the highest class is situated. The master's desk is on the middle of a platform, two or three feet high, erected at the lower end of the room. Forms and desks firmly fixed to the ground occupy the middle of the room, and passage being left between the ends of the forms and the wall, five or six feet broad, where the children form semicircles for reading. Boys attended school in winter, while girls attended in the summer after Father Meacham and Mother Wright's direction for gender segregation. In 1817, the Shaker School at New Lebanon was declared a public school by the state of New York. Despite the cutting-edge vision of the Darrow School's educational system today and the Shakers' reluctance to work with the state, Shakers still would have spurred education for pay. The fact that they agreed to cooperate with New York State in making the New Lebanon School a public school indicates that Shakers of the past might have questioned the operation of a private prep school on their domain. My wife and I were both thoroughly impressed by Shaker architecture. Many of the buildings have additions that appear as a hole was cut in the wall and an appendage grafted onto the opening. It's as though the Shaker Council met and determined they needed more space, engineered the best way to create more indoor space out of what they already had, and then collectively worked together to make it happen. The stone barn at New Lebanon is one of the most awe-inspiring achievements of Shaker engineer and collective construction on display. It's thoroughly impressive to stand inside. It is also inspiring to know that people worked in this barn for the collective good of the whole of the group. Engels hailed the Shakers as founders of modern communism, writing, the first people to set up a society on the basis of community of goods in America, indeed in the whole world, were the so-called Shakers. These people were a distinct sect who have the strangest religious beliefs, do not marry, and allow no intercourse between the sexes. And these are not their only peculiarities of this kind. He explained the defiant history of the Shakers and their triumph in the United States. The sect of the, the, sect of the Shakers originated some 70 years ago. Its founders were poor people who united in order to live together in brotherly love and community of goods and to worship their God in their own way. Although their religious views, and particularly the prohibition on marriage, deterred many, they nevertheless attracted support and now have 10 large communities. 
each of which is between 3 and 1,800 members strong. Each of these communities is a fine, well-laid-out town with dwelling houses, factories, workshops, assembly buildings, and barns. They have flower and vegetable gardens, fruit trees, wood, vineyards, meadows, and arable land in abundance. Then, livestock of all kinds, horses and beef cattle, sheep, pigs, and poultry, in excess of their needs and of the very best breeds. Their granaries are always full of corn, their storerooms full of clothing materials, so that an English traveler who visited them said he could not understand why these people still worked, when after all they possessed an abundance of everything, unless it was that they worked simply as a pastime, having nothing else to do. Amongst these people, no one is obliged to work against his will, and no one seeks work in vain. They have no poor houses and infirmaries, having not a single person poor and destitute, nor any abandoned widows or orphans. All their needs are met, and they need fear no want. They enjoy, as we said, the most absolute community of goods, and have no trade and no money among themselves. The Shakers were celibate separatists with pe peculiar religious views, according to Angles, but they had somehow achieved something remarkable. They were able to establish successful communism in living, something that no other sect before them had done. The Shakers built their first meeting house on Mount Lebanon, also known as New Lebanon, in the town of Canaan, New York, in 1785. The biblical land of Canaan was the promised land to the Israelites, and they escaped after they escaped from slavery in Egypt. Today, the idea that God promised the land of Canaan at Mount Zion to the Israelites is the basis for Zionism, a religious ideology that justifies oppression of Palestinian Arabs. However, for Shakers, it represented their escape from slavery to Orthodox religion. For them, Canaan, New York, was the promised land. Ironically, there is an obvious analogy in relation to settler colonialism between the Palestinian situation today and the situation of the people of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy in the late 18th century. Even before communitarian immigrants like Shakers and the Amana Society came from Europe, the native peoples of upstate New York were living in a form of primary communism. Pioneer anthropologist Lewis Henry Morgan, based in Rochester, New York, was the first to identify the way of life of the indi indigenous Haudenosaunee people of western New York as primitive communism. Later, socialists such as Sam Marcy of Buffalo, New York, based, uh, based the founder of Communist Workers World Party, could use the less pejorative term primary communism. Marcy wrote in 1992, Lewis Henry Morgan's writings on the communal life of the Iroquois in North America confirmed what the socialist movement in Europe had deduced about early societies elsewhere before written history, that there was a universal period when property was communal, there was no state, and the products of human labor were shared equitably. The Haudenosaunee Iroquois of what is now Western New York were some of the first communists in North America. Although their way of life was crushed by European settlement, they inspired settler communities that would come later. The indigenous Haudenosaunee or Iroquois nation organized their society in a kinship-based form of socialism. According to Morgan, the Iroquois practiced communism in living for centuries. Iroquois society planned for and met the needs of each individual. Extended families lived community, communally in large house, long houses and shared everything. They organized intercommunal trade net networks based on reciprocity. In 1881, Morgan wrote, Among the Iroquois, hospita hospitality was an established usage. <coughs> if a man entered an Indian house in any of their villages, whether a villager, a tribesman, or a stranger, it was the duty of the women therein to set food before him, and a mission to do this would have been a discourtesy amounting to an affront. If hungry, he ate. If not hungry courtesy required that he should taste the food and thank the giver. This would be repeated at every house he entered and at whatever hour of the day. Hospitality and harmony were key values in Iroquois society. By the 18th century, their primary communist system inspired settlers from Europe who came to the New World seeking refuge from religious persecution. Groups like the Shakers saw the Haudenosaunee as fellow travelers. Throughout the early 19th century, Shakers had visions of native spirits. While their possession rituals often amounted to what some today might consider racist stereotypes and melodramatic peasantry, melodramatic pageantry, they were remarkable as reflections of the Shakers' aspirations. They admired and wanted to live like native people. 
Historian Eric Seaman argues, Native spirits offered Shakers a sense of group identity through collective responsibility for past injustices and the possibility of redemption by acknowledging such historical misdeeds. They attempted to atone for the original American sin of settler colonialism by building a social order they hoped was in harmony with that of the Iroquois. The Shakers were among the first white Americans to aspire to live up to the communitarian call of the Haudenosaunee region. The biblical Canaan was located in the fertile valley below Mount Lebanon. Lebanon means white in Hebrew, and according to the Bible, the mountain was named that because it was covered in snow. In the Bible, Lebanon was known for its cedar and cypress trees. Cedar wood from Mount Lebanon was used in the building of the Second Temple of Jerusalem. The, bil the beauty of the region reminded the Shakers of the biblical promised land of Canaan and their own exodus from persecution in, in Europe, so they decided to settle there. The Mount Lebanon Shaker Society was home to Shaker pioneers Father Joseph Meacham and Mother Lucy Wright. Mother Ann Lee died in 1784, leaving Father Meacham in charge. He called Sister Wright to Lebanon from a community in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Shaker historian Sister Flo Morris describes the arrangement. Father Joseph chose a woman, Sister Lucy Wright of Pittsfield, Massachusetts, to be the leading character in the female line and set the pattern for a dual order of government with equality of the sexes far in advance of the times. New Lebanon became a center of leadership for the Shaker religion. Morse continues, Father Joseph and Mother Lucy made their headquarters at New Lebanon, and the New York community became the Mother Church. It was the first to collect its members into the way of life the Shakers called Society Order. From there, the Shakers put out the call to build communal dwellings and prepare for converts to arrive. Mount Lebanon was the model for communism and living not only for the Shakers, but for religious sects and radicals throughout the antebellum era. For a time, the Shakers increased their membership dramatically riding on the crest of the Second Great Awakening revival movement in mid-19th century upstate New York. However, ultimately, their prohibition on sex discouraged new members and prevented current members from having children of their own. The communal way of life became less attractive to pious Americans as the economy shifted post-industrial revolution. Engels concluded his review of the religious communists in America by remarking on their influence on the socialist movement that was developing at the time. The success enjoyed by the Shakers, Harmonists, and Separatists, and also the general urge for a new order in human society and the efforts of the socialists and communists that this has given rise to, have caused many other people in America to undertake similar experiments in recent years. Thus, Herr Genal, a German minister in Philadelphia, has founded a society which has brought 37,000 acres of forest in the state of Philadelphia built more than 80 houses there, and already settled some 500 people, mostly Germans there. They have a large tannery and pottery, many workshops and storehouses, and they are really thriving. It goes without saying that they live in community of goods, as the case with all the following examples. A Mr. Hisby, an iron master of Pittsburgh, Ohio, has set up his native town a similar society, which last year bought some 4,000 acres of land in the vicinity of the town and is planning to establish a settlement there based on community of goods. In addition, there's a similar settlement in the state of New York at Skinny Atlas, which was founded by J.A. Collins, an English socialist, in the, spirit, in the spring of 1843, with 30 members then at Minden in the state of Massachusetts, where about 100 people have been settled since 1842. Then two in Pike County in the state of Pennsylvania, which also recently set up. Then one at Brook Farm, Massachusetts, where 50 members and 30 pupils live on about 200 acres and have set up an excellent school under the leadership of the Unitarian minister, G. Ripley. And then one at Northampton in the same state, which has been in existence since 1842 and provides work for 120 members on 500 acres of land in arable and livestock farming, as well as in sawmills, silk mills, and dyeing. And finally, a colon colony of emigrant English socialists at Equality near Milwaukee in the state of w Wisconsin, which is started last year by Thomas Hunt and is making rapid progress. Apart from these, several other communities are said to have been founded recently, but there is as yet no news of them. 
This much, however, is certain. The Americans, and particularly the poor workers in the large towns of New York, Philadelphia, Boston, etc., have taken the matter to their hearts and found a large number of societies for the establishment of such colonies, and all the time new communities are being set up. Americans are tired of continuing as the slaves of the few rich men who feed on the labor of the people, and it is obvious that with the great energy and endurance of this nation, community of goods will soon be introduced over a significant part of their country. As I stood in awe of the triumph of collective agricultural, architectural, engineering, and constructive endeavors that is the stone barn at New Lebanon, I could not help but say a silent prayer of thanks to the Shakers for their example of communism in living and gender equality that was so ahead of its time. I think that this same spiritual work has to go on because it inf still is going to influence the world. However, if we didn't believe that, we couldn't believe that Shakerism was going to go on either, I don't think. I have a uh, definite uh, belief that Shakerism will never die. I think that the movement uh, affords uh, many individuals in this day and age something that they are looking for, uh, a sense of belonging, uh, a sense of uh, right-ordered life, a sense of being part of a, a larger whole. I think that Perhaps in short, what many are looking for in the 1970s is the uh, very sort of new family relationship which Shakerism makes possible. Communes have, well, they're sort of going down now, but they have been very, very popular in the last few years. And I think that is the first thing that has drawn people. And then I think that uh, people, especially young people and young adults, 20s, I think they're very disillusioned with the um, established way of life in the world now. I think that the most significant contribution of Shakerism uh, may well have been uh, the proving of the fact that men and women and children uh, can live together in, in harmony, in love, in, in self-giving, in a desire to build one another up in the spirit. Uh, this has been proven for over 200 years of Shaker history, well over 200 if we count the English beginnings. I suppose it's given, given everybody who lives the life um, a chance to be themselves because you really can be within the Shaker community. And also the chance to um, live, I mean, you're never without a family. That was some clips from the 1979 documentary, Shakerism, The First 200 Years. Uh, you heard um, documentary filmmakers Therese Couser and Eugene Marlowe uh, interview members of the Sabbath Day Lake Maine Shaker community, uh, of which apparently there there are two members remaining. They're the only two uh, practicing Shakers in the world at this time. Now we have a clip from an interview uh, from 2014 with Brother Arnold of the Sabbath Day Lake uh, Shakers, one of the two uh, remaining and surviving practicing shakers along with sister francis also of the sabbath day lake community and that was the, that was one of the great geniuses of mother is that she lifted up physical labor to a place where it was spiritual so we don't look down on labor everybody in the community has always labored i don't care how august and supreme you are you spent your day working 
hands to work, hearts to God. Notice Mother says hands to work first, before she says hearts to God, because you have to have something to provide. So that's what we strive for each and every day of our lives, because Shakers are very practical people. So it is, um, as Brother Ted used to say, we are to make life as little hellish for each other as possible. And so we strive to do good deeds and um, to make, make Christ visible and real to people. We touched on what we like to call the three C's, uh, which is celibacy, uh, in imitation of the life of Christ. Community of goods, because that's how Christ and the apostles lived. Uh, were all owned everything, but no one owned anything. And then third, which is the gateway into the church, which is the confession of sin or the opening of the mind. The historian Arthur Bester, in his 1950 book, Backwoods Utopias, The Sectarian Origins and Owenite Phase of Communitarian Socialism in America, 1663 to 1829, he starts with a discussion of the Moravians, a product Protestant sect that came to the United States very, very early on for the colonies. And then he goes on to talk about the Shakers, but he makes an economic argument. Well, he also makes the argument that social persecution combined with economic realities were the reason that these religious groups so Arthur Bester writes, The communitarian organization of the Moravians had existed in Germany at least before their migration, and the new American environment served simply to bring it to full fruition. Among the sects generally, however, it was more frequent for communitarian institutions to develop under the pressure of American conditions without previous foreshadowing in Europe. Such was the case with the Shakers. The little group of sectarians in mid-18th century England, of whom Anne Lee became the leader, appear to have developed no particularly collectivistic institutions in their mother country. And even after their migration to the United States in 1774, they at first found separate employment for themselves. Persecution, however, began, and during the Revolutionary War, it was particularly intense because of the recent English origin of the sect. Indeed, the fact that the Shakers, like the Moravians and most of the other communitarian sects, were an English-speaking group exposed rather than protected them. Their proselytizing activities were felt, correctly enough, to be a greater menace to established denominations than the efforts of foreign language sects. Persecution and the hardship of making a living combined with the millennial hopes of the Shakers to impel them forward into a fully communitarian way of life the forces at work and the process itself are revealed so clearly in the early official histories of the sect that the story may properly be told in the Shaker's own words. After Mother Anne and her little family arrived in this country, they passed through many scenes of difficulty of a temporal nature. Being strangers in the land and without any means of subsistence, excepting the daily labor of their own hands, they were obliged to seek employment where they could find it without hazarding the free enjoyment of their faith. They were led, however, to make some arrangements in the first place for their future residence where they could be united in mutual enjoyment of their faith and wait the call of God to more extensive usefulness. According to William Lee and John Hocknell, accordingly, William Lee and John Hocknell went up the river and contracted for a lot of land near Niskayuna in the county of Albany and returned again to New York. Thus, after passing through many trying scenes, Mother Anne and those who stood faithful to her were collected together, and in the month of September 1776, took up their residence in the woods of Water Valley, near Niskiuna, about seven miles northwest of Albany. The place being then in a wilderness state, they began with indefatigable zeal and industry, and through additional sufferings to prepare the way for a permanent settlement where they can enjoy their faith in peace amidst the tumults of the war in which the country was then involved. <clears throat> a missionary journey through New England lasting from 1781 to 1783 was followed by the deaths of Anne Lee on September 8, 1784. The official narrative continues. The society, being now deprived of the visible presence and protection of Mother Anne, 
Father James Whitaker saw and felt, with many others, the necessity of laboring for an increase of the subsistence of the gospel among the people, in order to maintain the testimony and protect them from the snares of wickedness which surrounded them, and the flood of opposition which now seemed ready to burst in open them from every quarter. And all those who had been faithful and honest-hearted being now firmly established in the increasing work of God were led in their travel to see and feel the necessity of being gathered into a more united body for the benefit of greater protection and a further increase of their spiritual travel. To constitute a true church of Christ, there must necessarily be a union of faith, of motives, and of interest in all the members who compose it. There must be one body and one bread, and nothing short of this union in all things, both spiritual and temporal, can constitute a true church, which is the body of Christ. <clears throat> and wherever that united body exists, it will bring into operation every individual talent for the general good of the whole body. In this united capacity, the strength of the whole body becomes the strength of each member, and being united in one spirit of Christ, they have a greater privilege to serve God than they possibly could have in a separate capacity, and are better able to be mutual helps to each other, and they also find a greater degree of protection from the snares of a selfish and worldly nature. The first step was to gather the believers into a body where they could enjoy all things in common, both of a spiritual and temporal kind, and in which their temporal interests could be united together and be consecrated to religious purposes. The gathering of the society began at New Lebanon in the month of September 1787 and continued to progress as fast as circumstances and the nature of the work would admit. Elders and deacons were appointed to lead and direct in matters of spiritual and temporal concern. Suitable things were erected for the accommodation of the members, and order and regularity were by degrees established in the society, so that by the year 1792, the church was considered as established in the principles of her present order and spirit of government. Those who were thus gathered into a united body were denominated the church, being a collective body of Christians, separated from the world and enjoying in their united capacity one common interest. The Moravians and Shakers illustrate the process that was repeated time after time in America in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. The New World offered hospitality to the peculiar religious doctrines that predisposed a sect to communitarianism. At the same time, it confronted such sects with social pressures of one sort or another that transformed those commutative tendencies from potentiality to actuality. The process, often repeated, gradually generated a communitarian tradition. The Pleasant Hill Shakers expressed their devotion to God in their labors and their worship. Sundays, this pleasant village was stirred by their emotional fervor. The believers gathered in the meeting house to worship according to the prescriptions of Mother Ann and experienced spiritual transportation. The great bell atop the middle family house rang out an invitation to worship and spiritual refreshment.
Shakers. Um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the writer, author of the Sherlock's Holmes, Sherlock Holmes books, uh, wrote in uh, published in 1926 a history of spiritualism, and he counted the Shakers as among the forerunners of spiritualism in the United States. He wrote. The Shakers had among them a man of outstanding intelligence named F.W. Evans, who gave a very clear and entertaining account of all this matter. Mr. Evans and his associates, after the first disturbance, physical and mental, caused by the spirit interruption, settled down to study what it really meant. They came to the conclusion that the matter could be divided into three phases. The first phase was the actual proving to the observer that the thing was real. The second phase was one of instruction, as even the humblest spirit can bring information as to his own experience of after-death conditions. The third phase was called the missionary phase and was the practical application. The Shakers came to the unexpected conclusion that the Indians were not to teach but to be taught. They proselytized them, therefore, exactly as they would have done in life. A similar experience has occurred since then in very many spiritualistic circles where humble and lowly spirits have come to be taught that which they should have learned in this world had true teachers been available. One may well ask why the higher spirits over there do not supply this want. The answer given to the author upon the notable occasion was, these people are very much nearer to you than to us. You can reach them where we fail. It is clear from this that the good Shakers were never in touch with the higher guides. Possibly they did not need guidance, and that their visitors were on a low plane. For seven years these visitations continued. When the spirits left they informed their hosts that they were going, but that presently they would return, and that when they did so they would pervade the world and enter the palace as well as the cottage. It was just four years later that the Rochester knockings broke about. When they did so, Elder Evans and another Shaker visited Rochester and saw the Fox sisters. Their arrival was greeted with great enthusiasm from the unseen forces who proclaimed that this was indeed the work which had been foretold. One remark of Elder Evans is worth transcribing. When asked, do you think your experience is much the same as that of monks and nuns in the Middle Ages? He did not answer. Ours were angelic but these others were diabolical, as would have been said had the situation been reversed. But he replied with fine candor and breadth of mind, certainly, that is the proper explanation of them through all the ages. The visions of St. Teresa were spiritualistic visions, just as we have frequently had vouchsafed to the members of our society. When further asked whether magic and necromancy did not belong to the same category, he answered yes. That is when spiritualism is used for selfish ends. It is clear that there were men living near a century ago who are capable of instructing our wise men of today.
Journalist Park Godwin, an American follower of the utopian socialist Charles Fourier, believed that the United States was well suited to social experimentation. At a convention of Fourierists in 1844, he said, The peculiar history of this nation convinces us it has been prepared by providence for the working out of glorious issues. Its position, its people, its free institution, all prepare it for the manifestation of a true social order. Its wealth of territory, its distance from the political influences of older and corrupter nations, and above all the general intelligence of its people, alike contribute to fit it for that noble union of freemen which we call association. That peculiar constitution of government which, for the first time in the world's career, was established by our fathers, that signal fact of our national motto, E Pluribus Unum, many individuals united in one whole, that beautiful arrangement for combining the most perfect independence of the separate members with complete harmony and strength in the federal heart is a rude outline and type of the more scientific and more beautiful arrangement which we would introduce into all relations of man to man. Godwin believed Fourierism was ultimately compatible with the American According to Godwin, the American Revolution inspired community-minded progressives throughout the world to stand up for their own visions of justice and freedom. Many settled in America seeking the opportunity to build microcosms of the societies they believed would be more just and logical than previous societal formation. Leader of the Russian Revolution, Vladimir Lenin, echoed Godwin's optimism about the radical potential of the American Revolution when in a letter to American communist sympathizers he wrote, The history of modern civilized America opened with one of those great, really liberating, really revolutionary wars, of which there have been so few compared to the vast number of wars of conquest which, like the present imperialist war, were caused by squabbles among kings, landowners, or capitalists over the division of usurped lands or ill-gotten gains. That was the war the American people waged against the British robbers who oppressed America and held her in colonial slavery. In the same way as these civilized bloodsuckers are still oppressing and holding in colonial slavery hundreds of millions of people in India, Egypt, and all parts of the world. Many Marxists saw the American War of Independence as an anti-colonial struggle in hindsight, albeit of a capitalist character. Marx wrote in his letter to Abraham Lincoln, the working men of Europe feel sure that as the American War of Independence initiated a new era of ascendancy for the middle class, so the American anti-slavery war will do for the working classes. The American Revolution was a progressive revolt against the old monarchist order that was co-opted by the capitalist middle class and installed them as the new ruling class. American revolutionary theorist Thomas Paine seized on the anger of the working class and won them to the side of a revolution that didn't necessarily represent their, their interests. However, the American free speak free-thinking spirit was effectively crushed after the Allied powers' victory in World War II. America's suspicion of communism became unchecked orthodoxy, as the Sedition Act and the House on American Activities criminalized whatever form of free speech might be used to advocate communism. When his patriotism was challenged before the HUAC, singer, actor, activist, and communist Paul Robeson said, My mother was born in your state, Mr. Walter and my mother was a Quaker, and my ancestors in the time of Washington baked bread for George Washington's troops when they crossed the Delaware, and my own father was a slave. I stand here struggling for the rights of my people to be full citizens in this country, and they are not. They're not in Mississippi, and they're not in Montgomery, Alabama, and they're not in Washington. They are nowhere, and that is why I am here today. You want to shut up every Negro who has the courage to stand up and fight for the rights of his people, for the rights of workers. And I have been on many a picket line for the steel workers too, and that's why I am, I am here today. When asked if Robeson believed his friend Benjamin Davis, communist city councilor of New York City and vice presidential candidate for the Communist Party, was a patriot, Robeson replied, I say he is as patriotic an American as there can be, and you gentlemen belong with the Alien and Sedition Acts, and you are the non-patriots. You are the un-Americans, and you ought to be ashamed of yourselves. The history of the early foundations of socialism in America was rendered taboo, erased, with several consequences, severe consequences, for violations of this proscription on speech. 
During the 1950s, historians of the Consensus School, including Lewis Hartz and communist turned conservative Daniel J. Borston, emphasized a liberal capitalist continuity in American history while de emphasizing early America's tendency to experiment with different social systems. As a result of anti communist witch hunts conducted by the House on American Activities Committee, as the state's and the Senate's Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations under Wisconsin Senator Joseph McCarthy, academics, journalists, screenwriters, novelists, actors, directors, union leaders, and public sector employees lost their jobs and had their reputations ruined for the mere rumor. Thank you, everyone, for uh, listening to this first edition of Pioneers of American Socialism. Uh, I'm glad to be able to start this new audio project, and uh, I'd like to do a lot more um, and cover a lot of different topics. I think the next one um, I'm going to do is going to be probably the Charles Fourier Movement. Uh, of the 1840s. Um, so stay tuned for that one.
Thank <laughs> you.